Okay, so there are some people in the lobby, and right now I'm admitting them into the meeting. Now the recording is on, and I think I have to put off the transcription. Okay, that's fine, the transcription. All right, so I've stopped the transcription. <clears throat> begin from the beginning of the semester, just a few general comments. Critical thinking is a course that has been designed to improve our methods of reasoning. Uh, these methods of reasoning are applicable to every subject, area, and profession, career, discipline, and pathway in life. So this is really a course that has been designed to improve our lives. Um, these days, when I reflect on my adolescence, you know, I find myself wishing that I took some decisions ah. that have higher quality, you know, even this morning when I woke up, I remembered, uh, you know, some decisions I took in the years back. And I was telling myself, look, this particular decision, uh, I could have taken a better one. But what I needed was principles of reasoning that would, uh, you know, uh, uh, make me make, uh, um, you know, better decisions accessible. So decisions are, you know, products of reasoning. And so the real question is about the quality of the reasoning process. So critical thinking, especially that of this semester, you know, begins an introduction into uh, a journey of improving the quality of your reasoning, of course. What we have this semester is just an introduction. If you really want to improve your reasoning, you have to go further in critical thinking. You have to go further in the course. You know. And so as part of the package, uh, we, we've, we, uh, we are supposed to study, uh, you know, um, aspects of language that are relevant to critical thinking. The semester has been divided into two. The first part of the semester, you know, introduces us to concepts in language that are relevant to critical thinking. You know, so what we will be doing, or rather what we are doing in the first five weeks, are those linguistic concepts, you know, that will be meeting time and again in critical reasoning. And then for the second half of the semester, we begin critical thinking itself. In the first unit, uh, you've uh, done speech acts. Now, whenever you open your mouth and say something, whatever you say is a speech act. You know, it's a speech act. Now, let me share uh, my slide on speech acts. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm trying to open, I'm trying to present um, some slides on speech act, but I'm encountering some issues. Um, I'm being, um, I think because my computer was uh, recently worked on, um, there are some security, uh, you know, protocols I'll need to observe before. I can present my screen uh, to you guys. Okay.
Okay, so I I hope you guys can see the slide. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, this is supposed to be what um, you guys discussed in the last class, or well, let me say the first class. Uh, a speech act is an entrant that performs a certain function in language and communication. We perform speech acts when we ask questions, make a request, assert a proposition, make judgment, express emotions, and so on. A speech act may be one word, a complete sentence, or an incomplete one. And also, basically, a speech act is whatever comes out of your mouth. You know? So the question is, which one is it? What kind of speech act? So there we go into categories or types of speech acts. And then the first, you know, the most prominent one is interrogative sentence. Interrogative sentences are what we normally call questions. You know, they end in a question mark. The purpose of interrogative sentences is to solicit or require information from someone, you know. Uh, do you have keys to the door? How are you doing this morning? What's your name? So these are questions. We call them interrogatives in critical thinking. You know. Then we have the imperative sentences. Imperatives are sentences spoken to require someone, to require someone to do something or undertake certain actions. You know. So imperatives, you know, you speak them when you want someone to do something. They include commands, instructions, directives, requests, and pleas, you know. A command is used to offer authoritative or dictatorial order, you know, an instruction is a direction or order used to guide someone to do something. A directive is an authoritative order used to establish a policy assign responsibilities, you know, and so forth. A request is an act of asking politely or formally for something to be done. A plea is a supplication for a certain action or decision to be taken. You know. So these are different kinds of imperatives. You have the hard and the soft imperatives. Drive to the junction and turn right. Done last week. Then you have the declarative sentences. These are sentences that convey information. They can therefore be true or false. So declarative sentences are spoken to make a statement. They end in a, a period. You know. So declaratives, you know, in contrast to interrogatives and imperatives. Declaratives are not, they are not uttered to seek information from you like interrogatives, and, and they are not uttered to get you to do something like imperatives. Now, declaratives are uttered to provide information. Provide information. That's why they are called that declaratives. That, 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 that. They, they come from the word declare. Somebody. <laughs> They do for your own brain, but if you have that, they do it. Yeah, so <clears throat> now declaratives include factual statements, value judgments. You can say value judgments and value statements. Then you have definitions, and then you have arguments. Now, so we have four kinds of uh, declarative statements. You have factual statements, value judgments, definitions, and arguments. The factual statements or statements of facts, you know, expressions that convey information about the state of affairs in the external world. So the factual statements are just statements of facts, you know. They can be verified, you know. Then, uh, you know, grass is green, snow is white. That man is a current provost. You can verify these things. So that's why we call them factual statements. They are statements about facts. Then you have definitions. Definitions are sentences spoken to convey information about the meaning of a word. So 
sentences that provide information about meaning of a word or word. So the function of definitions is to provide what meaning. A lion is a large carnivorous feline animal of Africa and Northwest India, having a short, tawny coat, a tufted tail, and in the male, a heavy mane around the leg and shoulders. So that's the definition of a lion. It, it provides you with information about the meaning of lion. A bed is a piece of furniture upon which or within which a person sleeps, rests, or stays when not wearing. So these statements are about meaning. Simple, you know. Then value judgment. A value judgment or statement is a claim about something's moral, practical, and aesthetic value or suitability. You know. So moral, practical, or aesthetic value or suitability. So it's about values. Value judgments do not, they don't describe the world like factual statements do. Rather, value judgments prescribe certain attitudes and behaviors towards the world. They are concerned with prescribing how the world ought to be rather than describing how the world actually is. And you know, examples, that's right, that's wrong. Michael is a good man. Jezebel has no conscience. So you can see that this is different from factual statements. You know, factual statements are about facts and value statements are about values. You see, then you have two types of value uh, statements or value judgments. You have moral value judgments, you have non-moral value judgments. The moral one example is abortion is evil, do not commit adultery, do not insult your spouse. Those are moral value judgments. Non-moral value judgments, you know, are claims about something's practical or aesthetic value. You know, so the non-moral ones are about practical value, practical value, utility value, or aesthetic value. You know, values like, you know, practical values like strength, Durability, you know, reliability, profitability, productivity, efficiency. Those are all practical or utility values. And then aesthetic value has to do with beauty, whether something is beautiful or not. So example, a foreign is an excellent student. So that's a non-moral value judgment an excellent student. The shirt is too tight on you, you know. So being too tight means that it is not, you know, serving its practical purpose well. That's, so it's too tight. That, that has to do, it has, being too tight has to do with practical value. That car is beautiful. So that's about aesthetic value. Then you have the emotive expressions, you know, sentences that express feelings. Emotive expressions show strong feeling, you know, sometimes they end in exclamation mark and sometimes not. You know, so example, I love that guy. That's, em that's emotive. I hate how she dresses. That's emotive. We hope you win it. But that's emotive. Hallelujah. That's an emotional expression. Sentence fragments. Sentence fragments are incomplete sentences lacking either noun or verb. You know, sometimes sentence fragments act as signposts to show direction or advertise a product. Examples of sentence fragments include um, so sentence fragments are incomplete sentences lacking either noun or verb. Example: Desmond for Parliament. Desmond for Parliament. So you can see. Sometimes sentence frag uh, fragments um, act as uh, campaign slogans. Desmond for Parliament is a campaign slogan, so it's a, it's a sentence fragment. Yam with sauce, you know, you can see that in front of a restaurant. Your dream house, you know, so these are sentence fragments. Okay, we have some exercises here, um, but I think you can go to. Um, 
your critical thinking textbook and do these exercises so that um, we can move ahead and do definitions before the time is up. Um, let me see. Rewrite the following emotive expressions as value judgments. Rewrite the following emotive expressions as value judgments. So these are emotive expressions. Convert them to value judgments. One, what a beautiful lady. What a beautiful lady is an emotive expression. Convert it to a value judgment. Anyone? Anyone? Does someone want to convert? Oh, yeah, what a beautiful lady is an emotive expression. So what's the value judgment? Write it as a value judgment. What a beautiful lady is emotive. To be a value judgment, the sentence will read in what form? She's a beautiful lady. Okay, the lady is beautiful. The lady is beautiful. How kind he is. How kind he is. That's a he is. expression. He is he's kind. kind. Yeah, so he's he kind. What? Oh, that's fine. So, what an extremely delightful journey. What an extremely Jenny delightful was. journey. This journey was. was. Yeah, the journey is extremely delightful. Okay, so the rest of these sentences, I'm sorry, the rest of these exercises, please, you have to find time to do them. Go to your textbook and get them done. So that we yes, can, sir. And, and that's the end of the speech act. Let's get over quickly to okay, right on. Yeah, some hands were raised, uh, but I didn't see them on time. So you can bring out your hands. Uh, there will be some questions at definitions in, in just a matter of minutes. So let's begin the mm. definitions and see what we have. Um, so definitions and their problems. So that tells you already that definitions can have problems. Definition of definitions. Definitions are statements used to convey information about the meaning of words. Sorry, let me repeat this call. Okay, sorry, I was responding so, to some queries there. Uh, so definitions are statements used to convey information about the meaning of words. So the function of definitions is to provide meaning. Now, being accurate about the meaning of things is essential in critical thinking. You know, uh, let me just give you a simple example of the importance of accurate meaning in critical thinking. Now, suppose you are making an argument about a concept and you don't have an accurate understanding or meaning of the concept. Now, what is the easiest way to, you know, stop your argument? The easiest way to stop your argument would be to simply point out that the meaning you have of that concept is not accurate. 
and then just show how inaccurate it is. And then the argument has to stop, you know, because the argument is like a vehicle that is not on the right road. You know, so whenever you are reasoning critically or arguing or making an argument or even making a proposal or whatever, and then you are doing so with an inaccurate meaning of, of concepts or ideas or things, it means that you are not moving on the right path. The starting point of a good argument is to first of all have the accurate meaning of all the concepts that you are using. So that's how important accurate meaning is to critical thinking, argument, reasoning, decision making, and all of them. Now we have two types of meanings. We have connotation or connotative meaning. Now, connotative meaning is a descriptive meaning of words. Any meaning you can write down is a connotative meaning. There are meanings you can't write down. Now, if you can write down the meaning of something, it means that that thing has a connotative meaning. So all the meanings you see in dictionaries, all the definitions in dictionaries are connotative meanings. They are the connotative meanings of words. But denotation or denotative meaning are more like examples of words out there, items in the world, you know. But denotative meaning uh, or denotation is like a representation of something out there. An item or, you know, an item or something in the world that represents, uh, you know, whatever we're talking about. That is the denotative meaning. So connotative meaning is a descriptive meaning and denotative meaning is like, um, you know, exemplary meaning, you know, more of an example. An example of the subject matter. Now, so we need to uh, bear this in mind. This distinction between connotative and denotative meaning—it's very important. There are some things you can't describe with words, so those things don't have connotative meaning. Example: You cannot describe color in words. What words are you going to use to describe color? How, how do you describe red? What words are you going to use to describe the color red? What would you say that red is? You know, red is what? You write it down. It's not possible. Similarly, you can't describe blue with words. You can only see it and then point to people, this is blue. So color, as an instance, has no connotative meaning. It has only denotative meaning. That is, you can only point to examples. Okay. Another distinction that is very important for definitions is the distinction between definiendum and definiens. Now, every definition has two parts, the definiendum and the definiens. The definiendum is the word or phrase to be defined. The word or phrase to be defined is the definiendum. And the definiens refers to the rest of the sentence, which does the defining. For instance, in the definition, cat is a large, long necked, ungulate mammal. The definiendum is cat, and the definiens is, is a large, long necked, ungulate mammal. So the definiendum is just like the subject, whilst the definiens is like the predicate in English grammar. So you are very familiar with subject and predicate. Now, the subject in a definition is called the definiendum, and the predicate in a definition is called the definiens. 
In critical thinking, when we just talk about definiendo, you already know that it is a subject in a definition, not in an argument, not elsewhere, but in a definition. You know, so we have specific names for them. Now, the subject in an argument is called the reference class. The predicate is called the attribute class, but that's for an argument. Now, this one for definition, you have definiendum and definiendum. So in ordinary English grammar, you have subject and predicate. In critical thinking, we have definiendum and definiens for, for definitions. And then we have reference class and attribute class for subject and predicate in arguments. You know, so today we are discussing definition. So our focus is on definiendum and definiens. Definiendum is the word to be defined, and the definience is that part of the sentence that is doing the defining. So let's move on to types of definitions. Now we have lexical definitions, also called dictionary definitions. You know, these are the definitions we find in dictionaries. Example, a lizard means any of the numerous small scaly reptiles typically having a, mod a moderately elongated body, a tapering tail, and two pairs of legs held outwardly from the body, consisting mostly terrestrial and growing species. So this is the definition of a lizard, which you are likely to find in a dictionary. We we'll call it a lexical definition. Lexical means having to do with the, the, the arrangement of words, the, the compilation of words and possibly their meanings. That's what we call lexical, lexicon, lexi this, lexi that. They are all about compiling words and their meanings. And the dictionary is just one instance of such compilations. We have ostensive definitions. Ostensive definition is a non-verbal way of conveying the meaning of a word by pointing to the actual object or demonstrating the meaning of the word in real life situations. So ostensive definition is a non-verbal way of communicating the meaning of the word. Now, ostensive definitions are, you know, last resort definitions that can be used for, um, you know, uh, those things you cannot define in a connotative way. That is, those things that do not have uh, descriptive definitions. So, ostensive definition is, uh, you know, showing the meaning of something by simply pointing to it. And this applies to things like color. You know, color words such as yellow, red, green, blue, and so on cannot be defined descriptively. They can only be defined ostensibly. Also, words that denote styles of dancing, for instance, Adowa, Abwaza, Zuntu, and all these things, they are defined using ostensive definition. So uh, trying to define or describe a particular style of dancing with words uh, might not be satisfactory. So you, you, you probably have to use an ostensive definition. You have to look for an example of that style of dancing and point to it and say, yes, this is what it is. Okay. We have theoretical definitions. Now, theoretical definitions are definitions that originated from specific disciplines. You know, there are some words that originated from certain disciplines. Example, inflation. Examples of words or definitions with theoretical definitions include, you know, those words that originated from specific disciplines, and therefore their definition also came from those disciplines. Example, inflation, which originated from economics. So defining inflation, if you want to define inflation, it's better to consult an economics authority. Bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder emerged from psychology. 
and I'm sure the psychologists have already defined what it is. Viral load. Viral load comes from biochemistry. That is the number of viruses in a blood sample. That's what they call viral load. Okay. We have stipulative definition. Stipulative definition, you know, we use this kind of definition when we assign a meaning to a word either for the first time or for a specific project. Now, a stipulative definition is a definition that any of us can, anyone at all can formulate. You can formulate a new definition for something. If, for instance, you are uh, you are doing a project or you are into a research project and uh, in the course of your research you find out that a certain word doesn't have you know from your experience in that research a certain word doesn't have uh, a good enough definition in the dictionary you can then formulate one yourself if you are writing a project you can say um, but uh, so, so, so and so dictionary has defined this word as so, so and so, and then you you write that uh, um, I I don't find this definition satisfactory for the following reasons. You state your reasons, and then you say in the light of these reasons, you know the reasons why I'm not satisfied with the dictionary definition of so, so and so. Uh, I would say that uh, for the purpose of this project, I will formulate uh, a new definition and say that these things should be defined as this. You know, you formulate a definition, which we call stipulative definition, that will serve the purpose of your project. You know, so anyone at all can formulate a stipulative definition. That's why it's called stipulative definition. Okay, so the Ghanaian word frenemy means a person who is an enemy pretending to be a friend or someone who is a friend but also a rival or an opponent. So that's a stipulative formulation within the Ghanaian space. It might not exist elsewhere. You know? So that's a typical example of a stipulative definition. And it was crafted you know, within the Ghana space to respond to a particular problem or trend or pattern that has been emerging in the Ghanaian social space. Then we have operational definition, defining a term by describing a set of actions or operations that when accomplished will determine the entity referred to by the term. And also, we can, uh, there are certain definitions that show uh, the processes of an operation or procedure. You know, certain terms, especially from the sciences, cannot be defined except you show how they came about. You know, in an experimental way. Now, um, defining a term by describing a set of actions or operations that when accomplished would determine the entity referred to by the term. Example, a solution is an acid if and only if litmus paper turns red when dipped into it. So that's an example of an operational definition. You know, a solution is an acid if and only if litmus paper turns red when dipped into it. So that is the definition of a solution. And then a substance is translucent if and only if when held up to a strong light, some of the lights come through. You know, so the first one is the definition of an acid. The second one is a definition of a translucent uh, substance.
Now, still an operational definition. Notice that an, an or note that an operational definition must specify an operation. For instance, the definition a solution is an acid if and only if it has a pH of less than seven is correct, but it is not an operational definition because it does not outline an operation. You know, a pH of less than seven is not by itself an operation. A procedure or step-by-step -step demonstration of a phenomenon. So, an operational definition must outline an operation to be called an operational definition. Not the end of an operation, but an, the operation itself has to be seen in the definition. Then we have essential or real definitions. An essential or real definition is the only definition that captures the necessary and sufficient conditions for a definition. All other definitions are unable to capture the necessary and sufficient conditions for a definition. Examples of essential definitions. A prime number is any number divisible by only itself and one. An even number is any number divisible by two. So essential definitions are the only definitions that are accurate, 100% accurate. And so essential definitions are found only in mathematics. You don't find essential definitions outside mathematics because that's the only place you can be sure that when you are treating something, you are treating it exactly the way it is and exactly the way it will remain even in a thousand years time. You know. Now let's determine the type of definition in each of the following passages. Now a house means this, and then you see a little picture of a house. What kind of definition is this of a house? Ostensive definition. Yeah, ostensive, that's right. Now, water means a molecule composed of two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. Water means a molecule composed of two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. What kind of definition is that? Operational. Operational is an operation. Yeah, the word bonded. The word bonded. Uh, gives it away as an operational definition. So when you see bonded, bonded is a process. So a nuclear family is a living unit composed of a man, woman, and their children. What kind of definition is that? Mexical definition. Ah, come again. Mexical definition. Lexical. Yes. So. Well, that's right. It's a lexical definition. But apart from lexical, it is also a theoretical definition because nuclear family came from where? Nuclear family originated from what discipline? So nuclear family originated from sociology. And so sociology gave us the word or the phrase nuclear family, as well as its meaning. So it is both a theoretical and lexical definition. Now, having understood different types of definitions, it is now time to look at some problems with definitions. Now, definitions are supposed to be accurate. Wherever they are not accurate, it means that there is one problem or the other. And so now we've summarized the most basic problems of definitions so that we can quickly discuss them. First of all, a definition could be too broad. A definition is too broad 
that the definitions refers to objects or properties beyond those needed to define a definiendum. If the definition refers to objects or properties beyond those needed to define a definiendum. In other words, if the items denoted in the definition go beyond what is needed to define a definiendum accurately, then the definition is too broad. Example, example, a toy is a machine. A toy is a machine. So a toy here is being defined as a machine. Now machine and toy, which one is larger or broader than the other? Now when you look at machine, a whole lot of this world are now machines. Machines are cars, computers, now all electric gadgets are machines. All mechanical gadgets are machines in one way or the other, you know. So when you define a toy as a machine, it means that you are defining a toy as all the mechanized objects in the world, which, which is obviously too broad. A toy cannot be a machine because there are so many machines that are not toys. So we say that um, the word machine contains items that go beyond toys. So it is an example of defining a definendum with you know, words that show things that go beyond what is being defined. You know, machine, you know, goes beyond toy. So technically, the definition is, you know, identified as too broad. That is, the, the, the definition is too broad. Too narrow. A definition is too narrow. If the definience fails to capture the full range of items needed to define a definition. So in this case, the definience does not contain the adequate number of qualities, the adequate qualities and items needed to define the definition. Example, a toy is a tiny car used by infants to play. A toy is defined as a tiny car used by infants to play. Now, tiny car, tiny car does not contain, uh, does not show the items that are adequate for presenting the meaning of toy. And that's because there are a lot of toys that are not cars. So many toys are not cars. You have children's buildings, children's dolls, you know, and even children's um, uh, head dressing gears that, that are toys. So toys go beyond tiny cars. There are so many toys that are not cars at all. So if you define a toy as a tiny car, then it means the definition does not contain or refer to the adequate range of items needed to define a definition. Now, a definition can be vague. A definition can be vague if there is no way of telling what class of things the definition refers. If there is no way of telling what class of things the definition refers. Example of a vague definition. Democracy is a kind of government where there is freedom for all. Democracy is a kind of government where there is freedom for all. This definition does not clarify who all refers, whether it denotes human beings, animals, birds, crocodiles, and so on. So saying that democracy is freedom for all is vague because it doesn't specify the particular class of items in the world that it is targeted at. A definition is ambiguous 
if the definitions presents more than one possible meaning of the definition. If the definitions presents more than one possible meaning, more than one possible meaning of the definition. Now, a sentence is ambiguous if it lends itself to more than one distinct interpretation. Examples of ambiguous definition. So now you saw that uh, a definition is vague if it does not specify a particular class of things the definition refers to. But in this case, a definition is ambiguous if it presents more than one possible meaning. So you can see the difference between ambiguous and vague. Vague means that there is no particular class of items you are referring to, but ambiguous means that you could be clear what you are referring to, but you are referring to two conflicting things. That is, the, you know, the sentence presents itself to various interpretations. Examples, faith is true belief. Faith is true belief. Now the question is whether we can have a belief that is true. If we can have a belief that is true. Beliefs are not supposed to be confirmed as true. And then you have a triangle is a figure composed of three straight lines intersecting at different points, at three different points in which all the angles are equal to 80. So in the first example, true belief could mean either sincere belief or a belief that is not false. You can see that both of them are not the same. In the second example, one wonders if each of the three lines is equal to 180 or a combination of the three lines is equal to 180. So when there are conflicting meanings, the definition is ambiguous. When there is no clear meaning at all, then the definition is vague. So that's the difference between vagueness and ambition. Vagueness means there's no clear meaning. Ambiguous means there are at least more than one clear meaning. Secularity. A definition is circular if the definitum appears in the definitions, or if the definitum is cited as part of the definitions. So to repeat the definitum, what is to be defined? In the definitions, or in an attempt to define a definition, is circular. Repeating the definitum in the definitions is circular. Examples, morality is to be morally right. So this is secular definition. It doesn't tell you, tell you anything fresh, or it doesn't tell you anything that is new. Morality is defined as being morally right. Now, when you present this to someone who doesn't know about morality or being moral, the person will still ask the question, what is moral? What does it mean to be moral? So that shows you that secular definitions don't achieve the aim of definitions. Metaphysics is a systematic study of metaphysical issues. Pentagon is a plain figure having the shape of a pentagon. So, I mean, concepts that are supposed to be explained are instead recycled, as if the recycling would be an explanation. Begging the question. A definition begs the question if the definition is obscure, digresses from providing meaning, or does not help in shedding meaning on the definition. So a definition begs the question if the definition is obscure, digresses from providing meaning, 
or does not help in shedding meaning on this definition. Example, now how do you define Jubilee House? Jubilee House can be defined as the office of the president of Ghana. That should be the appropriate definition of Jubilee House. The, it is the office of the president of Ghana. But what if someone tells, defines Jubilee House as the office where every Ghanaian would want to be? Is that a definition? Jubilee House is the office where every Ghanaian would want to be. That's not a definition. That that is that digresses from a definition to you know making uh, a statement about Jubilee House. The correct definition is that Jubilee House is the name given to the office of the president of Ghana. So when you hear that Jubilee House is defined as the office where every Ghanaian would want to be, you will say no. I beg your pardon. So if Jubilee House is defined as where every Ghanaian would want to be, what you say is, I beg your pardon, I don't understand. What is the definition of Jubilee House? You know, or you say the definition or the attempted definition begs the question of what Jubilee House is. And that's because the attempted definition has not really defined Jubilee House. A little exercise, diagnose the problems with the following definitions. Now, so these definitions, each of them has problems or has a problem. So identify the problem in each. A bird is an animal that has wings. What's the problem with that definition? The socket, why not? You remove the socket. Right? A bird is an animal that no, you has see. Wings. Not every, um, bear, not every. It's not every bear that has wings. It's, it's too general. Or oh, that is not every animal that has wings that is a bird. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's a bird. Two birds. <laughs> So it's narrow. Yeah, so a bat uh, is a bat, a bird. No. Yeah, but the bat has wings. Yes, so it wants to come to work. Bat has wings. Yeah, so someone, two people are raising their hands. Uh, uh, do they want to answer the question? Emmanuel, do you want to answer? I wanted to ask a question, but I'm okay with it with the definition you made. Okay, you uh you save the, the question. Let's uh, hear from some people. Vanessa, I saw Vanessa's hand up. No one seen Adam and Priscilla. So Vanessa, do you want to answer the question? Yes. Okay. It's now. Yeah, narrow. So why is it narrow? Sorry, it's broad. Okay, because so not broad. every bed that not every animal that has wings is a bed. Okay. Yeah, so you have to do the rest of these exercises uh, from your textbook. Do the rest of these exercises. Do them today before you go to sleep. You know, so these are the exercises I'm showing you so that you get through with them before you do your next topic. You know, uh, and since you are 
since you are at 100 level, and uh, I think this is your first, your very first semester. Unfortunately, this is the beginning of the semester. In fact, uh, I'm not sure any of you has uh, taken an examination in the university. So right now, you've not started uh, making your, your GPA. Is it that GPA, right? Uh, so I think this is the best time to give you a piece, uh, a piece of advice. I started by pursuing two degrees in philosophy. I got the first degree, you know, from Europe and the second one from Africa. Now, when I was pursuing my two degrees in philosophy, you know, I had the habit of, uh, you know, reading and doing exercises only before the IA or the exams. Whenever the IA or the exam was approaching, I would work very hard. I will read everything, do all the exercises. But when the result comes out, I will see that some people are ahead of me. And I was wondering what, what was wrong. It was only halfway through my first degree when I started studying with someone who got a first class that I saw what was wrong. You know, what was wrong was that, you know, after each lecture, I would just pack the books. I will read them before the exams. You know, but um, so after I met this guy who was who, who, who got first class, I started reading my books immediately after the lecture. So when there's a lecture, I will read, I will read it that day. You know, for best results, I will sleep over it, wake up the next day, and go through it. I make sure I read it the next day. I will read, take notes. Wait, let, me, let me take care of this. Okay, so I would read take notes, do some jottings, you know. I even had a stapling machine. So when I'm done jotting on pieces of paper and I'm done reading, reading, jotting, taking notes, I would staple everything and then file it. That's for a particular topic. By the time it's time for IE, I have several bunches of paper you know, each of them about a topic and each of them containing the primary material which was given in class, some jottings, some notes, some remarks, some references to extra material, all of them stapled into a bundle. I'll get out the bundle, go through the bundle and try to do some, you know, a bit of a secretarial work. That was how. So I started making my first class grades from halfway through my first degree in philosophy. And because of that, I didn't end up making a first class because first, uh, first class grades, first class grades in only 300 level and 400 level cannot give you first class. Already you have second class grades in uh, 100 level and 200 level. So when you combine second class grades in 100 level, 200 level, with first class grades at 300 level, 400 level, it just stops you short of a first class. And that was how uh, I, I denied myself of a first class. But I started another degree, you know, this time around in mass communication. Now, by the time I started the degree in mass communication, I was already practicing the first class tricks. And then I got my clean first class in mass communication. So if you are to go by what I just said of my experiences, it means that at the end of the lecture, you would, uh, you, you, you sit down and put together all we did right now, organize them, read them, 
do all the exercises, make notes, write things, piece them all together with a stapling machine, file them. Next class, you do the same. The next class, you do the same. When it's time for IA or exams, you have a couple of things to work on. Like you just get your first class. There's no magic. It's just straightforward and it's simple. It doesn't even take any energy. You could even be lazier than those who are reading only during exams. They'll be killing themselves during exams. But I think the, the secret is that you've already gotten your mind well organized ahead of time. You know, So there's nothing anyone who is reading only during exams can do to beat you. So what it all means is that you need to uh, get your textbook, start doing all the exercises immediately after classes, or at least the next day. Don't allow it to, uh, to don't allow 24 hours to elapse, because the consciousness of the lecture is still in your system. So you have to get all those things done when the consciousness of the lecture is still fresh. That's the magic. If you miss it, then you can't you can't get first class. You know. So these exercises, please get your materials and do them later. So that's the end of the class for definitions. If anybody has any questions, he should ask. But before you start asking your questions, I was told uh, we were told that um, the official textbook for the course uh, has run out. And then when we made further inquiries, um, we got an information from the Dean's office, the office of the Dean of Arts, who, which produces the books, but um, they might not be available until another semester. So it looks like you guys are going to miss the officially required textbook. Uh, so, um, but what happens is that there is another textbook, you know, there's another book in the university's bookshop at Kingdom's Bookshop, uh, Kingdom's Books beside the Ban Library. Uh, it is titled Understanding and Applying Critical Thinking. You can go for that one. It treats exactly the same topics. And uh, luckily, uh, it has at least 100 exercises for each topic. Uh, the officially required one has just about 10 or 15 exercises for each topic. You know, so you can get that one. And then another advantage that that one has is that uh, when you start treating fallacies or bad arguments at the end mm. of the semester, the officially required texts uh, treated um, 12 fallacies or bad arguments. Well, that one treated, uh, I think, 38 or 40 fallacies. You know, so even after your exams, when you go for your holidays, you see that you have a whole lot of fallacies to read about. OK, so any questions? Please, the title of the book again. Um, understanding and Applying Critical Thinking. Understanding and Applying Critical okay, Thinking. Yes, it's um, colored red and know. black. The color of the book is red and black. So that yes, sir, can, like know. Yeah, so that can act to. as a substitute. So you can use that as a substitute for the required text. Wherever there are discrepancies between that book and the required text, I'm sure it will be a minor thing you can resolve or you can ask any of us. You know, but I think the, so the topics are the same. You know, in fact, that is what I use for my lectures. The topics are the same, and uh, uh, there are a lot of exercises in that one too. Uh, it was written by those of us who are teaching the course, and we wrote it to improve on some weaknesses we noticed in the official text. Now, because of those weaknesses in the official text, the official text itself is now being rewritten and reviewed. And that uh, probably explains why uh, we are missing it this semester. You know. Any other questions? How much is it? Oh, I how can't remember. Uh, I think uh, 70 or there about. Yeah, 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 I think it's a big book. It goes for around 76. Yes, Any other with questions? The question, with the, with the questions like, are there answers attached to it? Or 
Yeah, I think you can find the answers at the end of the book. Let me see. The answers must be somewhere. Yeah, I remember when we were writing it as a group of lecturers who we had to provide answers to the book. So the answers are somewhere. Either the answers, the answers must be at the end of the book, at the index where you are titled, you know, where the place that is titled indexes or something. I think before the indexes, the answers come before the indexes or so. Okay. Uh, so you check, you can go there and check for yourself. Or probably the answers are at the end of the chapters themselves. So you have the exercises just before the answers, something like that. But uh, I think you should go and verify that. In our next class, we'll be dealing with these courses discourses, various kinds of discourses. A discourse is also called a passage. You know, when you are looking at a write-up, any write-up at all, that write-up is actually a passage. And we also call it a discourse. And the question is, what kind of passage is it? There are a few basic kinds of passages. Either it is a narrative, like in novels, or it is an, argu an argument, an argumentative passage, like you find in journals and, you know, the argumentative section of some newspapers. Or it is an instructional passage, like you find in manuals. You know, there are books called manuals, books that instruct you on what to do in certain areas of life. Then that's a manual. In that case, the passage is called an instructive, uh, an, 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 an instructional passage. Or it is um, a rhetorical polemic, a rhetorical polemic. A rhetorical polemic will be a venting of feelings or emotion in a write-up targeted at a particular topic or person, you know. So four basic kinds of passages or discourses. You have narratives, arguments, instructional passages, and rhetorical polemic, which I'll be treating them next week. Any other questions? Are there slides also in the Sir. You have to be louder. Sir, I think that if you don't have questions, otherwise, that have raised their hands on the way. I think they have questions. Okay, let me look at the raised hands. Actually, I had minimized the class attendance page. So I'm trying to find my way there. But first of all, I have to locate my cursor because I can't see it right here. My uh... So you have a number of raised hands. The first one is not a name, but a number. 1104-3706. Uh, do, you, do you have a question to ask? Yes, sir. I would like to know, are there specific rooms that we will have an assignment or maybe a test or something? Or we are going to wait to, for the um, semester exam? Uh, I didn't. I didn't hear you very well. You, you have to raise your voice. Uh, okay. I wanted to know, like, are there specific, like, number of weeks that we are going to receive an assignment or a quiz, or we need to wait for the semester quiz? Um, the assignments themselves have a particular period. The assignments, uh, well, um. I think you must have received an assignment, your first assignment already. That assignment must have a deadline. <laughs> you have to find out what the deadline is from the coordinator. Uh, I'm sure the coordinator must have specified the deadline in the assignment. If she didn't, then you guys have to contact her to, to, to get the deadline. Well, if she didn't give a deadline, then probably it doesn't have a deadline. Maybe it is the kind of assignment that doesn't have a deadline. Involved. But okay, you need so to we... check. You need to check her messages to be sure 
that there's no deadline. If there's a deadline and you miss it, that will be a problem. Anyway. Okay. You are going to have uh, the interim assessment. The interim assessment, which is also called the IE, uh, comes up at the middle of the semester. That will be around uh, the sixth week or so. That interim assessment is about 30 marks, you know, so you wouldn't want to miss it at all. So I'm sure that most of these assessments are going to have deadlines, deadlines for submission. So any other question? Emmanuel, is it going to be collateral here or not? Um, yeah, I think it will be online, but it will be on-site. It will be both online and I suspect on-site as well. On-site means that you would have to go to a certain place, a particular place to take them online. Yeah. Instead of staying wherever you want, you know. So, uh, when that time comes, I'm sure the coordinator will communicate to you. You know. Uh, sit week. And then Richard, Richard. Uh, uh, Richard. Hello, hello, sir. Yes. Please ask. Oh, hello, sir. Please, is there is there a way we'll be able to get the slides you are using? Mm -hmm. so the slides are part of the class, you know. So when you are watching the video, you'll be seeing the slides. But I think the textbooks are more important than the slides because the slides don't really contain uh, enough training to familiarize you with the with the topics. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so you you watch you, you you watch the slides by watching the videos. And remember that when okay. watching a video, each slide enjoys about, um, you know, you you see each slide for at least at least two or three minutes before it it, it goes to another slide. Yes. And yeah. Yes. So anything apart anything apart from that should be your textbook. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Was that Richard? So now Robert. Um, sir, please. I wanted to ask the uh, jargons also a, a, an example of theoretical definition. Uh, theoretical definition. Yeah. So ask. What is it about these theoretical definitions? Um, I wanted to ask the uh, jargons also an example of theoretical. Yeah. Definition. I didn't get what you said about uh, what you asked about theoretical definitions. Jar I, I I I was saying that I, I jargons jargons. Are they an example of theoretical definitions? Yeah, theoretical definitions are definitions that we got that emerged from different academic disciplines. D disciplines. Yeah. Um, from theoretical theoretical definitions are definitions we got from. Definitions we got from different academic disciplines, you know. Theoretical definitions are those definitions that, uh, when you look at them, you immediately suspect the disciplines they came from. So, for instance, if you see the definition of inflation, you, you suspect it came from economics because we got the word inflation from economics in the first place. So, you know, inflation, bipolar disorder, when you see bipolar disorder, uh, the definition is likely to come from psychology because bipolar dis disorder is a psychological term. You know, so those kinds of definitions, which you can, those kinds of definitions which you can trace to certain academic disciplines, we call them theoretical definitions. Although they could also be lexical definitions, and even some of them could be operational definitions as well. So uh, a definition could satisfy several, uh, the criteria of several types of definition. Okay. 
Hello, then sir. Sa- yeah, yes. Uh, ah. Who is that? Is that, is that Richard? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. Yeah, please. Uh, my, my question is on the real definitions. Hmm. Yeah, on, on the real definitions. Hello, sir. Yeah, the real definitions, uh, that is the essential definitions. Yeah. Now, the, the, the essential definitions are the only definitions whose accuracy is guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. So the only uh, definitions and, whose accuracy is guaranteed, and you you normally find them in mathematics. Outside mathematics, it's, it's difficult uh, to guarantee the accuracy of a definition. Aha. Uh-huh. So so yeah. So I, I wanted to ask a question. I read somewhere whilst I was reading on it, uh, and they suggested one example, and I and I wanted to ask you the validity of it. Uh, the example was a sister is a female sibling. I write it in uh, one of the slides. A sister is a female sibling. And I wanted to know if that one stands because that one is not mathematics. A sister? Yeah, a sister is a female sibling. A sister is a female sibling. Yeah. Now, um, now, that cannot be uh, an essential or real definition. Because uh, the, 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 uh, the the point is that um, uh, sisterhood, you know, sisterhood uh, has uh, has um, acquired several meanings. Uh, remember that a sister, a sister is also uh, a female religious cleric in the Catholic Church, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and in some organizations, uh, a sister is uh, a female fellow of a certain rank in some organizations or fraternities. You know. So it cannot be an essential definition because uh, it, it it can be contested with several. Uh, mean, it has several meanings. And once a certain word has several meanings, it means that. It is uh, what we call it essentially contestable. It, it's an essentially contestable term. Okay. Yeah. So any word that uh, is open to contest cannot uh, ca- cannot be defined in an essential way because the definition can change with a change of context. You know, so the definitions depend on context. Female sibling depend on one context. Uh, female cleric in a Catholic church depends on another context. Uh, female fellow of a fraternity or organization of a certain rank depends on another context. So such the, the sister can never be an essential definition. Okay, and please, I have a second question too. Uh, uh, at, it was under the operational uh, definition when you gave the example about um, water. Uh, water is two molecules of uh, hydrogen bonded to one molecule of oxygen. I wanted to ask: Does that definition also qualifies to be uh, uh, a theoretical definition? Because I think that's the same definition in under chemistry. When you look into it, so I wanted to know that the same definition also qualifies as a uh, theoretical yes. definition. Yes, I okay. mentioned it. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned that most operational definitions could also be theoretical definitions because you can trace them back to some disciplines. Okay, okay. thank you. So, um, Sandra, I think Sandra. Uh, seems even less in line, but Emmanuel wants to yes. say something. No, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, the, you were talking about hello. an assignment, but some of us, me like this, I have no reflection of any assignment on my Sakai. So 
I'm confused about the assignment you're talking about. Okay, so has anyone received any assignment? No. 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 So that's okay. I've heard you. No. You you don't need to prolong your news. Uh, so that that means that the assignment has not yet been deployed. It hasn't been deployed yet. Yes. That's what it means. And I'm not the one. I'm not the one deploying it. So that's why I'm asking. I just wanted to confirm if it has been deployed. Uh, but you have confirmed that it has not. You know. So by the time it's deployed, I'm sure uh, when you read the deployment, you will see the deadline. By the time an assignment is deployed, I'm sure you'll see the deadline. You know, um, It's possible some assignments might not have a deadline, but I think I've seen that only once in the past. So when you see an assignment, note the deadline and then make sure you do it before the deadline. And then uh, just a little tip, you know, it, we, we live in an age of uh, unreliable internet, you know. So uh, if you postpone your assignment to the last day, you might miss it because on the last day, you could your internet could have problems and then you'll not be able to submit. So please ensure that you do your assignments as soon as you get them so that you are sure that you've gotten it in. Once you have missed an assignment, you have to wait till the end of the semester. And then you plead with the coordinator to see if she has enough time to give you another one. Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be possible. It would mean that you have lost, you have lost uh, the, the number of marks that comes with the assignment. You know? So please, you need to be careful about the issue of the assignments because uh, sure. if care is not taken, some of you could miss the assignments. Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Yes, sir, I think uh, the assignment circulating is for certain groups because there was this one time an email was going around for a physics class and then it, it was saying there's an assignment, but it wasn't for all the groups. It was for a particular group. So I'm thinking... It's it, it's an assignment for some of the groups, but not group 11 or 12 or probably that. OK, that's fine. It means that yours is going to come sometime along the way. Yeah. All right, so Sandra, yeah. please. I want to ask about the brain teaser, the last, the first question we asked. So a bird is an animal that has wings. Um, I wanted to ask, I want to ask if um, it could probably be too broad and ambiguous because, um, as you said, bats is not a bird, it's a mammal, and then um, not all birds have wings. Yeah, so um, uh, the example of the bat shows that not all animals that have wings are birds. So it means that having a wing goes beyond being a bird. So that, that means that defining a bird as anything with wings would be too broad. And so is it both broad and ambiguous? No, it's not ambiguous. There's nothing ambiguous. Ambi ambiguous is to have two meanings. There's no contest of meanings. So being ambiguous is when there are more than one meaning that are competing for attention. But this is not a problem of meaning. Hello. OK. Yeah. So, Nanama. Yeah, I want to play with the... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. I want to ask you Yeah, go ahead. Emmanuel, you were saying something. Yes, sir. About the um the bed stars. Like I'm not too clear with it. That 
It's not um, any it's animal safe. that has wings. It's a bird. I'm not too clear. To yeah, that's that. because that's probably because you've not settled. So what you do is to go home and think about it. I'm sure it will be clear to you when you uh, give it some 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 thought. Okay. Okay. So Nanama. Yeah, Nanama was going to ask a question. Yes, sir. So please, I said I want to ask whether you can also use dictionary meaning as a special definition. Dictionary. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mean um, can you use dictionary meaning as um, essential definition? For example, pizza is a junk food. Can you also give an example if maybe you are asked to give examples of essential or real definitions? Yeah, I'm sure there are some essential dic definitions in the dictionary. For instance, I'm sure dictionaries will define a prime number or an odd number or an even number and those things. So uh, some of the Essential definitions will also be dictionary definitions. Okay. So please, so does it mean that with the essential definitions, as you said earlier, that is only present in mathematics as exceptions? Yeah, you find them mostly in mathematics because mathematics, mathematics is the only area of life where accuracy is guaranteed. Outside mathematics. Even in science, even in science, accuracy is not always guaranteed. But please, I'm asking whether with the essential definition, there are exceptions, as I gave an example earlier on. So it's not all the time that you can find it outside mathematics. Mm, uh, Hello? Yeah, you mean, are you asking Hello, whether sir. essential definitions are exception, uh, exceptional definitions? or That's whether they are exceptions from normal definitions. Uh, the thing is that essential definitions are um, uh, a particular class of definitions that uh, you know where you can where you can remove uh, you can remove the definiendum you can remove the definiendum of an essential definition and then if you were never aware of what the definiendum is looking at the definiendum alone will give you the definiendum that is for an essential definition. Let us suppose that you were never aware of a, of, the, of a particular definiendum. But if you look at the definient, just by looking at the definient, you know what the definiendum is. And so you can remove the definiendum and then ha have it replaced anytime without any difficulty. But, but you cannot do that outside essential definitions. You know, I just gave an example of um, sister. Now, when you say a sister is a female sibling, a sister is a female sibling, let's assume that you've never seen the phrase sister or the word sister, and you were just given, uh, you know, female sibling. You were just given female sibling. Uh, now, female sibling, you know, or is a female sibling, is a definient. Now, if you are given, if an examiner gives you is a female sibling and asks you to find the definiendum, of course, you know that the definiendum is sister. Uh, but what, what if he also gives you, um, uh, you know, uh, a certain female rank in an organization that you don't know? and ask you to find the definiendum. And then you don't know what the definiendum is sister. And so you have 
sister for two different definients, female sibling, female rank in an organization, you know. So that cannot happen in an essential definition. A definendum has only one definient. The definendum of an essential definition has only one definient. It can't have two. So when you see, uh, when you see, when an examiner gives you a definient like, is any number divisible by only itself and one? any number divisible by only itself and one, and ask you to find a definendum. The definendum is prime number. The prime number is any number divisible by only itself and one. Now, prime number has only one definience. It doesn't have more than one definience, but sister has up to four or five different definitions. That's why sister is not an essential definition, but prime number is an essential, can be, uh, you know, has an essential definition. So that is how to know the difference between an essential definition and then, you know, a, a non-essential definition. So I hope that answers your question. Now we have Sheriff, Sheriff Seydou. <laughs> now you have Lexon. Lexon, do you have something to ask? Yes, please, Prof. Um, Prof, I was reading a, a book about critical thinking, and I found out that he, the book explained that two narrow means um, if the defin the definitions eliminate things which should have been, and it gave example like students who wears uniform. But when I was reading the two broad, the two broad is giving plenty meaning of definitions. So I'm asking that um, the example that it made under the two narrow can it be used? It seems that too broad. Could you use that students who wear uniform? Prof, please, are you getting me? A student is someone who wears uniform. Yes. Under, under too narrow. It was given example under too narrow and gave that example. But yeah, but we know is students it, have many means. Yeah, but is it only students that wear uniforms? No, please. Yeah, so that means the, the, the definition is too broad. Uh-huh. Thank you, Ross. If you say that a student is someone who wears uniforms, it means that a student is also a soldier, a policeman, a fire serviceman. Uh, a student is all those things. Okay, thanks, Ross. I was very confused. Thank you. All right. Prisla, do you have a question? Yes, not a question, but I just want to add up to what Lexan said. Uh, okay. Sir, please, what about it being a uh, Because not every student wears uniform, like university students. Mm, not every student wears uniform. Not every student wears uniform. Uh, yeah, not every student wears uniform. Um, yeah, so that is supposed to be narrow, but I think the broad one takes precedence because there are other people that wear uniforms apart from All right, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we are going to stop here.
and so that I can upload the recording to your platforms for the benefit of all those who uh, have missed the class. And even for the benefits of those who attended the class, you can always watch the video. I advise you watch the video a couple of times before you take an assessment. You know. So until our next class on types of discourses, I am wishing all of you a very happy weekend and um, a blissful preparation for the coming week. Thank so you, sir. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Oh, thank, thank you, you.